putting them up on YouTube. Cool. And by law, I have to tell you that you're being recorded. Mm -hmm. And you generally, I guess, strictly by the law, have to acquiesce to being recorded. But it only sees me. It's your voice still here. If you don't want somebody to hear your voice, have a nice cup of shut the fuck up. <laughs> All right. All right, so today, I'm going to start off, what's that? Just the sound bite. <laughs> I'm going to start off with digital logic today, because, and, and, and this won't be intuitively obvious why I'm doing this until we go and get a little bit further down the road. So digital logic, um, we've not really talked about this. There's um, three major functions. I'm not going to go into simplifying it, but there's a whole, it's called Boolean math. We, we talk about math, we usually work in the decimal system, right? One, two, three, four, zero through nine. Boolean logic is zeros and ones. And, and, and how to do math with those. So, but, but there's, called logic because it follows the rules of logic. Everything is a yes or a no, a true or a false. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is an AND gate. And you have A and B are your inputs. Y is your output. I use that pretty, pretty universally as A and then Y. And then you have an OR gate. Oh, an AND is a, uh, the symbol is a multiply, an OR is a plus um, for digital logic. Not when you write code, when you write code then they have special characters, but A, B, and Y, and then there is a NOT. And uh, A and Y. Now, what you don't see here is there's power was ground, but these are signal paths. So, so this would be, say, if this was by itself, it'd be a one, two, three, four, five, probably a six-pin chip. One of them's not connected. One wire ends A, one wire's B, one wire's Y, power and ground. These have what's called a truth table. Again, logic. And the truth is if I have, whoops, not X, A, B, Y, and AND gate. So I have four possible choices I have here. Generally, we call zero false or off or zero. And so if I look at my four combinations, this is counting by binary, so in Decimal this would be 0, 1, 2, 3. In binary, it's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. An AND gate, Y is equal to A and B. The only way you get a truth is both things are true. A true and a false is a false. So 0 and 0 is 0. 0 and 1, 0. 1 and 0 is 0. 1 and 1, and 1. True and true. Is true. Got it? Seems simple enough. An OR gate is exactly what it sounds like. This or that. So if I've got, how about I do it this way? This is AND. That way I don't have to keep redrawing all this. This is OR. So if it's OR, false or false. False. False or true, it's true. True or false, it's true. True or true, it's true. So that looks like I don't know. Not. This is also called an inverter. This, uh, how would I write this? This is A. And B, Y equals A and B, Y equals.
equals A or B. Y equals not A. And so here we'll say not. A, so this is this is not A, right? So A, not A is true. Not false is true. Not true is false. Not true is false. Make sense? I'm wondering about the inverter I did. That that's what it we inverted our logic. One went to zero. Okay. Zero went to one. Oh, because it'd be hard for you. Yeah, because it's A. Alright. It's only A, so we're only looking at that one. B B doesn't go with me. Now these don't have to be just two. There's three input, four input, ten input, a million input. And 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 the truth table grows equally. So I'm staying at the very simplest end, which is just two. Now, there's uh, De Morgan's theorem. I'll talk quickly about De Morgan's theorem. De Morgan's theorem says so. When I get into, we'll back off. Notation. This would be a equal y. Or y equal a, I'm sorry. So when you get to the notation, that little ball tells you that it's a knot. The, the circle means inversion of logic. You could be going along on some old schematics, and out in the middle of nowhere, you'll see that. Because the guy who designed this half made an assumption that true means this. And the guy who did this half made the assumption that true means that. And so when they put them together, nothing worked, and then they figured it out, and they put, oh, we need to put, oh, we need to understand that our logic is inverted now when we go through here. And, and, and the truth is, there's no actual piece of hardware doing that. It's all conceptual. And when you see those, it drives you bad. Because, this is why you need ICDs, Internet Interface Control Documents. This is what this means. This is how you use my thing. That's why these are so great, because there's an ICD for what this is and what each one of the things is. So, if I did this, A, B, Y, this would be Y equals to not A, and B. So now I have to invert A, and that changed that truth table, right? Because now A becomes 1, 9, 0, 0. And now all my logic would function. Yeah. Same if I move it to here. If I move it to here, Y equals A and B, not A and B which is almost the same as an or, if you start thinking about it. And so the same goes for an or, I can do this is equal to not A or B. And that would be not A or B. And, you know, you just do the truth table and you say, oh, well, where I see a not A, zero becomes a one. And that's, that's how the output acts. Now we're going to more this theorem. If I have an AND gate, and I follow it by an inverter, that is equal to an AND gate with not an AND, right? Basically, Y equals not A, so I'm pushing these things through. De Morgan's theorem says I can push this through, and this is called a NAND, not AND, equal NAND, and a not OR equals a NOR. So that's a NAND gate. That's a NOR gate. 
I can push this through logically, and a NAND becomes an OR with both inputs inverted. Hmm. And we can prove that real quick. We can say A, B, and I can say NAND, and I can do A, not A, or not B. So I can do A and B, not. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. A and B, 0 and 0 is 0, but that's not it, so that's a 1. 0 and 1 is 0, but that's not it, that's a 1. 1 and 0 is false, but not false, so true. True and true is true, but not true is false. Right? Now, not A, not false. Oh, well, it's not false, I already know it's true, because it's not over A. Right? So, not false or not false. Not false or false is still, it's an or, same thing. Not true or not true, false. The Morgan's theorem. Because remember, I'm inverting the A. So, uh, yeah. so not true or not true, is the same as false or false, which is false. Your choice is false or false. It's false. The next version of the Morgans, so now you can say, well, gee, you play some games here. Um, if I have an inverter followed by an inverter, I put a one there, then I've got a zero there, but then I've got a one back out. One, not one is zero, not zero is one. So that tells me that if I invert and invert, I effectively do nothing. Well, why the hell would you want to do all this stuff? It, 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 I get it. Why the hell would you want to do all this stuff? You call it logic? <laughs> this, these are called truth tables. And if you actually want to sit down and do real logic, it follows this. I mean, even if you start talking about, oh, well, if I want to do this and this and this and these other things, I want to plan a trip. If you can boil it down to yes or no's, this works. And this works really well. It's called logic because it comes from the roots of the original logic theorems by Socrates and Plato and those guys. I, I, I don't remember the whole lot. I know. I can say it's very reverse. Well, so, oh, hold on. so well, look, now I've got, I've taken, I've taken a NAND, and I know that a NAND is basically that thing, right? Uh, 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 an OR with the inputs. But now I can do this. And now I've turned an AND into an OR. And you say, well, why the hell would you want to do that? That's kind of dumb. Well, I can take an AND, and I can tie both inputs together. And now I've got a knot. Right? Because A goes to both. And this becomes not A. Well, so if that's A is 1, then I get a 0 out. And if A is 0, I get a 1 out. A NAND is what's called the universal gate. Back in the bad old days when they were building mini computers and they had their first silicon device chips, they made everything out of NAND gates. You need a knot? You use an AND, you use an AND and you wire it this way. You need an OR, you do this, you do this, you do this, and, and, and you go through, and what you can actually do is you can synthesize your circuit, and then you can say, well, this last one is an AND, and now I can start pushing, doing the De Morgan, pushing that thing through, and you can actually work the math in a way that you do everything with NAND gates. And why the hell would you do that? Because back in the 1950s and 60s, those chips were 
ten dollars a piece, and they weren't real reliable. And now do I need to carry a box full of nans, a box full of nors, a box full of ores, a box full of inverters, or do I just carry one box full of nans and I buy them in bulk and get the price break? And now my CPU is literally a card this big, actually usually three, four, or five cards this big that are nothing but C's and NAND gates. But if it goes bad, you know how to troubleshoot it, you go, ah, it's that one, pop it up with a screwdriver, pop it in. Now your computer's back up. That's sort of the root of all this. Okay. There's also another gate that is. Um, <laughs> there's also another gate that symbol as this. This is XOR. That's exclusive OR. And A, B, Y. Y is equal to A. A or not B. It's B. You can have A or B. A or B. I think it's. There. It can be A and not B, or it can be B and not A. If, if in the truth table for, sorry, I don't, the truth table for XOR, A, 0 and 0 is 0, 0 and 1 is 1, 1 and 0 is 1, and the two ones is false. These are your base digital functions. Very useful. Hmm. The first one, we talked before about, I'll we'll just go off on this little tangent. We talked about we talked about that Arduino Uno, well, it's, the chip that's on Arduino Uno, this little silver thing here is a uh, crystal. Crystal oscillator um, that, when combined with some of the circuitry here, creates a 16 megahertz square wave that everything runs off and knocks that. There's an internal oscillator in there, and the way the internal oscillator works. Is a one, not one zero. If that's a zero, not zero is one. Well, if that's a one, not one is a zero. But wait, you started out here. This works because it takes time for the signal to go through. So, bang, 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 bang. Oh, now it changes to a zero. Bang, 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 bang. This thing will scream. Well, I can do this on a chip. And I can get you a gigahertz oscillator. It won't be good, it'll be all over the place. Temperature shifts, everything else, it's going to swing, people get close to it. You add in this RC and you can actually set the time. Because with the RC circuit, when you get the when when the when the input goes to a one, when that fires as a one, what you'll see at, at that point there. Is something that looks like this. So it takes time, it adds constant time for to go through. So I can, and same when it goes to the zero, and I go back to zero, it does that. Yeah. Or actually, it does that. Sorry, not that wrong. The other one, the other one, right? You're right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's like that. Yeah. Got both backwards, it works out. 
<laughs> no, that's the other thing. So by adding a known delay in there, you can control the speed. Yeah. You can even get a little bit better, and then you can actually put a crystal on here. Kill it off that. Uh, and do some other stuff to tie it all in. But that that uh, that crystal is basically this. It's super resonant. It only works at it because of physics. It only works at a certain frequency, plus or minus like a thousandths of a percent. And now you've got a pretty rock steady clock. For what it's worth. Yeah. Sure. All right. Yeah. I told you about all of this just to tell you about the tools important. That's what we'll use on the little bit. So we're doing range finders tonight. How do I know how far away that wall is? I'm going to guess it's. Three-ish meters, ten-ish feet, maybe twelve, or let's see, disconnect that one, put this one in. This is a rangefinder, and we'll bring it up here. So we can see it on there. <laughs> uh, that is approximately centimeters. Uh, <laughs> I can only go as far away, but <laughs> and there's weird bounces. somebody online decides to be bored to death, they can see this. Sorry, people online. I'm a bad, bad camera. And there's a wall or some object. And then it bounces back. Out to a quarry and you yell and you hear an echo. 
some milliseconds later. If I put a pulse in, at some point, I'm going to get a pulse back out. So, provided that I've got enough gain and the room's not too noisy and we're starting to get on some of the problems with sonic sensors. Um, but I know that sound at standard temperature and pressure, 20 degrees C to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, at one atmosphere, travels at about 735 miles per hour or uh, approximately equal to 1135 feet per second. If I remember right. So, or they choose your meters. I don't remember the meters. I think it's like 403 meters per second. Right. Um, so, if I start a stopwatch here, right, the second hand one going around, when I send this pulse and I stop it when it gets back here, I know how far that sound traveled. Right? Yeah. It's the trick when, when you hear it, when you see lightning and then you hear the thunder, right? You count off seconds. It's about a second, it's about a thousand feet or so. So every five seconds is about a mile. So you see the flash because the lightning, the, the, the light from the lightning moves at the speed of light. You see it instantaneously. And then the sound moves along at just over a thousand feet per second. So now I know if it took one second for this to get back here, T equals one second, I know that that sound traveled 1135 feet because sound moves at 1135 feet per second. I know that the distance was that over two. <laughs> get the that over two part? That one throws me the other one. Had to go there and had to come back. So, if it took one second to do a round trip, it was only a half a second that divided by two. So it was 615 feet. 12, no, 735 feet because round trip, or 1135 over two, I'm sorry. So after one second, when I turn it off, now I suddenly start to hear it again, and I know uh, that was that far away because as soon as I turn it off, I can still hear it. And then it'll go for a second, and now I'm waiting a second, right? Because now I can't do anything else until I get it all the way back, and I know that there's no signal coming back. Because now I start doing what's called range ambiguities. So I'm going to talk about this with sound, but this is true of everything. Let's say I use a half second pulse. Half second pulse, I've charged the air here and I've turned it off, and now it's going to come back and it takes a half a second to get back. And so I lit off a half a second pulse, a half a second later, I get a half a second long pulse. I still know it's 1135 feet. What if this is 1135 feet and 
and this is 2,270 feet. that one gets here. And the thing that is exactly double the distance away, to me, seems like it's happening. It's, really, it's called a range gate error. My range gate for this setup that I've done here is a half second. Anything that is an exact multiple of that far away will give me a false range gate if the signal coming back is enough that I can see it. In a noisy room like this, we can be sitting here whistling anything a lot of high frequency stuff in there. You can see how that's bouncing all over the place because it's out of sync with this. And some of that high frequency stuff is in the detection range of that high frequency circuit. High frequency circuit. So now, especially if you're a machine shop and there's a router running over there, that has got a lot of high frequency noise in it. I mean, it just sounds high frequency, but there's stuff there that you can't hear. And it can be making these things go completely nuts up on there. So, Sound, easy, nice and slow. Doesn't require high speed circuits, but as soon as it starts getting loud, and it's also limited distance, uh, and you know, it'll bounce off of these things nice. Bounces off of people, okay, we're kind of squishy. Dogs, cats, they've got a layer of insulation over the top of them that works for audio too. So, critters. You gotta get closer and closer and closer, or bigger and bigger and bigger, to get the equivalent signal back to make it work. So the next question is, well, let's do something else. The next thing we can do is RF. In the sequence of human events, they went to RF first because that was what was available first. Is that radar? Radio. Radio. Radio frequencies. RF. RF is radio frequency. Radar is radio detection. and ranging. What's the ranging? No, how far away is it? Oh, I guess that's a place. No, 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 it's just the range, range of target. It's a range fund. The original radars were just an antenna that set off and they came in one direction. Really wide. And it looked over this part of the sky when, they, when, when the Germans were looking for the Brits, the Brits were looking for the Krauts, right? And for their airplanes, and if it was anywhere in there, you saw a blip. Aha! The Kaiser are sending some stuff this way. We can scramble fighters and hopefully they can see it. Then they start getting clever and putting them on scanning heads and you know, there and there and there and there and there and there. And there up and down and left and right and I can say he's actually right there he's, I'm running two radars at once doing this and, and well he builds a box this one's going this way I detected it here this one's going this way I detected it there I draw the two lines together I'm not exactly a triangulation but yeah so in the course of history we did radar first because it was the technology that was available first and for most things, it's probably still the most useful long distance take, uh, stuff. But even close in, um, a lot of the uh, automatic door openers at, at, at supermarkets and whatever, I think originally they were sonic, 
but they had all sorts of problems. A squeaky wheel would set it off, or some kid crying, the doors would open up and let all the warm air in and, and all the vegetables spoil. <laughs> or the bananas get flies all over. Um, they're actually X band radar. They'll set off on the radar detector. Yeah, I uh, remember. <laughs> and so the first thing you think is, well, with sound, I just count the time. 1135 feet per second. I don't know. 12. Let's see. 10 feet, I would be a hundredth of a second. I mean, that seems fast. It's faster than you and I can twitch or move or whatever, but, you know, in the scheme of electronics, it's slow. In the, in the, in the scheme of, you know, that little computer that's running at 16 million cycles per second, that's half of an eternity. Um, but with radio, it's moving at the speed of light. Literally, at the speed of light. And that's about 300,000 kilometers per second. Fast. Light is so fast that we didn't even realize it moved until like, I don't know, 500 years ago. I mean, seriously, <laughs> it moves. The sun's out, it's there. It takes five minutes to get here, or eight minutes to get here from the sun. Um, so, a high a counter that counts at those speeds is hard. Uh, I'm actually one of the little things I'm, I was wanting to try and get done before tonight, but I didn't get there. I didn't even get close. Was to build a circuit that would actually do the timing of this. I was going to use an FPGA to do that because there's no way in hell I do this in the streaming um, One. So this is. 300 million meters per second. So if I have a digital counter that can count, and whenever my pulse went out, I reset it. So it went to zero. And this clock is running at 100 megahertz. That means that I have three meters of time, which means I can see a one and a half meter distance. That's about that far in my fingertips from the rest of the So you say, well, 100 megahertz, I listened to that on the radio. That doesn't seem like a big deal. That's a big deal. That's a, that is a spiffy speed of time, uh, especially in the technology of the time where you know radios were AM, they were. 90 kilohertz, or, or 100 kilohertz, in the range of. Um, if you want to get, you know, this was, this little sonic sensor was giving me centimeter resolution. Well, now I want to get centimeter resolution. Now I've got to go 300 million and add two more zeros on the end of it. I'm talking about 30 gigahertz type clocks. And that's hard. One, uh, a one gigahertz clock will get you down to about three inches. Two gigahertz clock will get you down to about somewhere on the order of an inch. Ish. So what do you do? How am I going to measure the distance of this thing all the way up to the format for this thing? We're still going to have range ambiguity problems, but this is an antenna, and I'm going to put this behind it to say it's a dish or something parabolic, so it's directional. I'm going to send out a signal. And it's going to hit my object. It's going to come back. And it's going to hit this other receiver, or this other antenna. Excuse me. And I'm going to get the signal back out. And let's make 
this easy. We just shoot together and say, This is 10 meters. Which is uh, about 30. Let's make it three meters. Three meters. Three meters. It's ten feet. And that was dyslexic for a moment. Three meters, ten feet. I send out a signal at the speed of light. It's a nanosecond per foot. That means I sent out this pulse on a frame of time. If I'm 20 nanoseconds, so bing, 20 nanoseconds. That's about proportional. Okay. If I am exactly 10 feet away. First was dyslexic, now it's colorblind. 
to the minimum amount of effort. I see that, right? So this goes from low to high, high to low. This is in time, and time, time, the time, time over two equals the distance. So t divided by two d equals t divided by two. Distance is time divided by two. Time is distance. That's why we're talking about light years, light seconds. And you don't do things in parsecs because that's also a unit of distance. Um, X is X or zero, 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 zero. Actually, if I get one, this goes high, and then it goes high, and it stays high forever, right? Because when this is, they're, they're perfectly out of phase on the exact right distance where we, this shuts off just as the signal gets back. It's perfectly aligned. That never goes low. That tells me something. That tells me that because I know that this original pulse was only 20 nanoseconds, I'm taking this and this and I'm doing an exclusive order. And this is distance. What happens if the place that I'm going to is shorter? What if it's only 15 nanoseconds away. Now, what I'm going to see is this guy's low, 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 10 nanoseconds, 15 nanoseconds, he's there. Um, He's going, to go, he's going to go high five nanoseconds earlier, like that, right? He's five nanoseconds closer. Mm -hmm. That wall's five nanoseconds closer. That means I go high five nanoseconds earlier, and it also means I drop low five nanoseconds earlier. Now, when I'm exclusive boring, I'm sorry, I said exclusive bore states zero, one on all those. Exclusive bore states zero on all those. Exclusive war was always zero. I lied. I didn't lie to mistake. Now on this one, exclusive war is. Actually, I take it back. Exclusive war was one. Now it's one, zero. One, zero, one. Now I just modify it. And you say, well, gee, how does that help me? I still can't measure the width of that pulse. It's too freaking fast for the measure. I was having a hard time measuring 20 nanoseconds, and now you're telling me I've got to measure five, right? Well, if he moves another five nanoseconds closer, what happens? This range gate opens up. Now it looks like this. I just went from a 100% duty cycle to a 75% duty cycle to a 50% duty cycle. I am pulse width modulating my signal. We talked, to, remember I brought in the, 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 the microphone connected to the Arduino, connected to a speaker, and I was talking into the microphone, and I was taking the analog value and turning it into a PWM, and it sounded like hell that you could hear it and understand it. If I take this out, I basically get a PWM function, pulse width modulated function of distance over two, and I can feed it into a first order filter, and now what I get out is, so you missed out on this, pulse width modulation is a way of encoding energy in time. So, if you imagine that I have a bucket, let's do it this way. I have a spigot. That's actually a pretty good spigot. <laughs> <laughs> and I have
have a bucket. And every minute, I'm going to take this bucket and I'm going to dump it and I'm going to see how much was in the bucket. And what I have here is not the normal turn on, turn off like you see on the side of your house, but it's, it's a, a throw valve, like a gate valve or a ball valve. So it's on or it's off. There's no choice. It's on or it's off. Gotcha. And now if I say it's on, it's off. It's on, it's off. It's on, it's off. If every minute I was, if, if, if I had a one gallon per minute, if my max flow rate, flow max, equals one gallon per minute, and this is a one gallon bucket, if I turn it on and off every second, it's on for a second, it's off for a second, it's on for a second, it's off for a second, it's on for a second. I'm only going to do half a gallon of water. If I turn it on, I'm going to use it two seconds. If I turn it on for three quarters of a second, I turn it off for, uh, this is getting hard because I'm using weird numbers in our type right? Because I used two. If I turn it on for 1.75 seconds and turn it off for a quarter second, turn it on for one and three quarter, turn it off, it's going to fill up 75% full. If I only turn it on for a half a second, I should have said one and a half seconds. If I turn it on for a half a second and leave it off for one and a half seconds and keep doing this for my one minute, it's only going to fill up 25% full. So this is kind of like, uh, I, I get what you're saying. Um, is this the, uh, kind of like, I guess I'll put it into uh, physical use, like a triple charge as opposed to a full charge? Uh, sort of. This is a way to use digital circuitry to represent an analog, continuously changing value. Okay. Our Before we got into this whole quantum mechanics thing and realized that everything really is a special case of digital, we said everything's an analog. It can be really bright. It's not full bore noon or dark as night. It's some level of gray in between. Okay. Right? And mm -hmm. I don't know what that level is. I cannot perfectly represent that level. I'm coming really close. Mm -hmm. But I can't perfectly represent it. Okay. It's called an analog world. Okay. As opposed to a digital world, which is one or zero. Yeah. It's true or it's false. Got it. Okay. And so, but what I can do is, by changing how fast, if, if I keep this period, this is the period, the same, but I adjust this pulse width, then the total energy in this period is changing. The wider the pulse width, the more energy, the narrower the pulse width, the less energy. And this is called an integrator. It's also called a low-pass filter. And so what I'll see is a relatively linear, um, if I do a chart of, how can I do this chart? This is going to be an interesting chart. Um, PWM percent per V out. Um, percent. What is the V? Voltage out. I'm using voltage. To, so this, this, our logic gates out with voltage. The voltage is the signal that we're usually monitoring. So it'll go out and then it'll go down on and it'll go off. Part of that's current. It's the current, it's the voltage, but the voltage is the driving signal for us. Um, what we'll see is a little bit of a curve at the bottom. It'll be fairly linear and then it'll curve off at the top. But in this region here, it's pretty linear. And this actually goes from about 
somewhere around two to five percent, up to around uh, ninety-eight to ninety-five percent of the maximum range. So if you know that you're never going to go all the way to the edges, and you can design things, and if you stay down in here, you're good. But now I can use an analog to digital convert. And those are fairly fast and are fairly old technology. You know, do what I want. And so now I can feed this. Uh, uh, that's the wrong symbol. I can feed this to an analog to digital converter and have bits out. And it's a direct representation of the time of flight. Does that make sense? So far. I mean, are you following it? Am I? It's a fun game we play. Now, the problem with it, 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 it's good and bad. The problem with RF is it spreads. It, it's, if, if, if I used it, so there's no such thing, but if I used the, 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 uh, the uh, mythical isotropic antenna, which means it radiates equally in all directions, and the thing doesn't exist, but if I have an antenna floating out here in space somewhere, and it radiates, it radiates this way, and it radiates kind of this way, and it kind of radiates this way, all directions. What you see is that your energy is being spread over the surface of a sphere, which means it's or direct relationship is uh, over radius to the third power, I think. So we can do all sorts of other things that go on top here, but energy out is approximately equal to energy in over pi square root, or cubed, r cubed. One meter, I get my energy out. Two meters, now I only get for eighth an eighth of my energy out. Ten meters, now I only get a thousandth of my energy out over here. And now realize that when that hits this, it's bouncing back again as another hemispherical wavelength. And now I'm actually taking um, I'm not sure if it's a two r cubed or would that be the equivalent of r to the sixth? I don't have to go through and do all the math, but your signal is really small. And if you've got a really good antenna that really focuses the beam, it's still a couple of degrees. So, a couple of degrees, you know, a couple of degrees from here to that wall, it's, I don't have a range sensor here, but it's probably 50 or 60 feet away, that's a spot that big on the wall. If I want to see an airplane at 10 miles, that's fine, an airplane is pretty big. If I want to see me at 10 miles, that's yeah, kind of hard. But the nice part is with the radar beam, I can shape it. If I have a, I'm going to draw this. I've drawn this before. I can shape the beam so that the beam isn't just a circle going out. I can shape the beam so it's shaped like this. So it's really thin this way, but it's really wide that way. And this is your airport radar that's sitting here going, right? It's this really tall beam that sees everything, but it covers everything in one pass. I don't really care what the altitude of these guys are. I care where they are. And what I'm really doing in my what I'm really doing in my airport radar is I'm coming around and I'm getting range detection off of them. And from this, I can also learn a bunch of other stuff. But I'm also querying them at the same time. And the airplane is actually coming back and saying, "Oh, I'm this airplane." I'm at this altitude, I'm going this fast, and I'm going that direction. And so I come across there and I say, there's a guy there, and he sends me all the data back. And I say, oh yeah, that correlates. Yep. There's modes on some military planes where you can tell all sorts of different things. I'm an F-16, but really I'm a 747. Yeah. And I'm going from, I'm going, I'm flying from Havana, Cuba to Miami. Really um, going the opposite direction. But yeah, there's lots of fun games you can play to really screw with people if 
you're so inclined. And a lot of people are so inclined. Um, but I, I've been out of that game for like 25, 30 years, so I don't really remember a lot of it. So now we say radar's great. This is the game you can play. But it has its disadvantages. Also, certain frequencies, low frequencies need a giant antenna. The lower the frequency, the bigger the antenna has to be. Um, it has to be on the order of wavelengths, or a you know, minimum quarter of a wavelength. But when you start talking about the wavelength of a 20 hertz signal or a 100 hertz signal, when it's moving the speed of light, that's I don't even know how big that is. Like, you know, a, a one hertz signal would be 300 million meters long. A hundred megahertz signal would be 300 meters long. A quarter wavelength would be a 150 meter antenna. That's why these fucking radio antennas are so damn tall. Hmm. They're 150 meters tall with respect to the ground plane, which is the Earth. Ish. 300 feet tall. Um, but you can go, yeah, you can go, as long as it's an even, a full wavelength works, a quarter wavelength works, a half wavelength works, as long as it's even divisions, you take losses, but you can get there, so you can play games. And that's, why, that's why the antenna on your car doesn't have to be 300 meters tall. It, it's in the range, it's in that band, but you're going to be taking a big hit on energy grab. Hmm. Um, so light. Well, I don't know, in the 1950s, somebody invented the laser, or maybe it was the 1960s. And holy cow, a laser could pop off a beam of light it's coherent. And part of the fun stuff of coherency is that the beam doesn't spread much. The divergence of a, of a, of a hell, even a cheap, I don't have one handy, but a cheap pocket laser pointer. If I point it here, I've got a dot that big, and if I point it 50 yards away, it still won't be that big. Now you run into the same. So now the first big advantage is I'm not losing this R, R cubed uh, uh, energy dissipation over the surface of that sphere, at least on the way out. I'm losing it on the way back. But I've effectively gained, I've, I've, I've effectively made my output power three orders of magnitude. Instead of having to put a thousand watt signal out, I only have to put a one watt signal out to get the equivalent range readback. Assuming, assuming on the other end that my receiver is just as sensitive as it was on, for, the, for the other. Drawback, of course, well, it's only a point that big. Now, I can find cat at 500 miles now because the point's only going to be that big. But if I'm not exactly on cat, if I'm off a tenth of a degree, I don't see cat. Instead, I see my mom, or Steve, or Dave, or Glenn, or Trevor. I don't see Trevor. All right. Trevor's wearing black. We don't see Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> so now we get into this thing where you have to be really, really, really precise with your pointing. Or all sorts of things, or you get really big lenses that can gather a lot of light. But I mean, it, it, now we're getting into the trade space, right? I can use, I can waste a lot of power and weight. I can waste a lot of power, but not necessarily a lot of weight, onto a radar that's going to have a fairly wide beam. But I'm going to be able to detect within, you know, if I, as long as I get you somewhere in that circle. If I get you, so oh, there you are, right? Whereas with the laser, it's the other way around. I'm here, and that's the dot that I got to get somewhere in the circle. And there's a lot of stuff out there that ain't that circle, right? And so the first thing is with the with the radar, I send out a pulse, and I cover 
this great big chunk of space all at once. This laser, I get this little bitty space. So if I want to cover the same area, now I have to raster this little guy back and forth, 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 back and forth. And even though I've taken this big, honking, expensive, power-hungry transmitter and made it with bitty, it's going to take me whatever the ratio of the area of that circle compared to the area of that circle many times longer to cover the area and get it. So clearly there's uses for one in certain circumstances and there's uses for the other in circumstances. If all you're doing is measuring from here to there, well, a laser is a really good way to do it. Um, and the reason a laser, you get into issues, if I want to use RF, if I want to use radio, then I've got to worry about the Federal Communications Committee, Commission, whatever it is, whatever FCC stands for. Because if I accidentally jam some little old lady's bingo, or Price is, price is Right on, and it, it's not Bob Barker anymore, who is it now? Drew Carey. Drew Carey. Drew Carey. If, I jam, Drew Carey. if I jam Drew Carey and some little bitty gets pissed off and she calls the police, they're going to come after my ass, and they will. That they will, they have teams, that that's all they do is drive around and look for people who are making electronic noise that they're not supposed to make. Wow. Because you could jam somebody's emergency signal. And they really don't like you fucking up their public airwaves. Especially when little old biddies start to get angry. Because <laughs> then they'll never stop calling. Never. And then once they realize they have a number where they get somebody, then when they get lonely, start talking about the cats and shit. <sighs> have you ever worked a helpline? Mm -hmm. I know you have. <laughs> yes. Are we plugged in? <laughs> the perfect customer in the internet business is the customer who signs up for a year and they have a turn off notice on their phone line. <laughs> that way they can't call for tech support. <laughs> Yeah, my work does that. If you have a computer, if you have an IT problem, you have to submit a help ticket through the internet. Yeah, great filter. <laughs> <laughs> One step better, our phones are void. So if a network switch goes down, I can't even make a phone call. And I'm not allowed to go upstairs and bang on the door of the local IT guy. He has to, he. He's actually pretty helpful if he'll come around and help and go look. But he has to wait. He won't get paid for his time if he doesn't get a trouble ticket from our help center, mm -hmm. which is not even in the same building. It's not even in the same country. Our, our help center is, we actually own a building in India. And our help center is literally in India. My computer doesn't work, so I'm going to help ticket. My computer doesn't work. <laughs> How can I submit the help? <laughs> can I go to a public, you dial, a public unsecured terminal and open this ticket for you? <laughs> you dial 5 help. It's a VoIP phone. I can't. What do you mean you can't? You've got a phone. It's hooked to the internet. It talks over the internet. Okay, I'll fix it myself. So they, yeah, I'll figure out how to fix it. But they have no open tickets. <laughs> I actually learned a lesson that if you put, I had, a, I had something that needed to be done on high priority because I had to give a presentation to a vice president in three days. And I had to get a PowerPoint together and it involved me turning data into usable numbers, which means I need software to do that. And we're not allowed to install software on our machines. We have this little thing called Bit9 that sits there and looks at it. And if it's not an OK executable running on your machine, it shuts it down and doesn't let it run. So I put in a help ticket. And they, I said, I need this as high priority. To get a high priority help ticket signed off, you have to have a VP sign off on it. But the VP that I needed to brief in three days was out of town, so I couldn't get a VP to sign off on it. And by the time it was all done, it took two weeks. And they finally said, oh, we've got it. Is it done? I said, I don't even 
give a shit because I gave the brief three weeks ago, I brought my own laptop into work, I dumped the stuff on it that you don't want me to do, but you made it, you chained my hands so I couldn't do anything with this. So my lesson learned, and I've been told that that was the one lesson you shouldn't have learned that, was never to make it a high priority ticket if you're in a hurry, put it in as a low to priority ticket, and they'll think, oh, that's easy, I'll put it on the top of my queue. <laughs> 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 wow. Pessimism? Maybe. Realism? Absolutely, it's a way to game the system. <laughs> yes, it's a low priority ticket. It'll take you five minutes. Yeah. Sorry. When you're doing enough tickets, I can say that would actually work. <laughs> no, that's where we get around to it. I mean, today would be nice, but you know, we also. <sighs> Lasers. LIDARs. There's two different kinds of... We've moved along in technology again. So... LIDAR is a laser detection and reading. I actually usually do this, which is a special form of LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging. I don't have to use a laser, I can set off a flashbulb. I, I know when I set the flashbulb off, I, I see when it blinked back. Um, laser, if you didn't know, is light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. Acronyms inside of acronyms inside of acronyms. XOR nor not. So the real easy thing to do is to come back and do PWM thing we just talked about. And I can use, I don't have any LEDs on there anymore. I can just use an LED and I can uh, put a lens on it and you'll see this little guy up here has, this is a Benwake? It's a little Chinese thing. I bought it from, from DigiKey, the little black thing here. I bought it from DigiKey for 40 bucks. It has a infrared light emitting diode in it with a little lens, and on the other side it has a little lens with a little light receiving diode or phototransistor on it. It sends out a pulse of light, it listens for the light to come back. It's got filters. Now I don't have to worry about polluting the environment with RF frequencies and, and pissing off biddies and, and their cats. I don't have to worry about the guy with the jackhammer next door screwing up my range measurements. Uh, it's a low enough power laser, and it's in a bandwidth that I don't care about. It's not going to burn my eyeballs out. Um, seems to answer a lot of questions, right? It's cheap, or I can use a laser. This thing has a, this thing has a spread that's you know if it's this close, it needs to be this big. But once you get about two feet away, it needs to be about that big. So it's similar to RF from the point of view of its capability, other than it's really short distance because the light's not going to travel very far. Um, so diode lasers. Yeah, that one, I, don't think, I don't even think it's a diode laser. I think it's just a diode in that thing, to be honest. Okay. And they're playing the same game I did there with the, the XOR gate and whatever else. But the problem you get is you, know, you get into the analog to digital converter. And, and when you do an analog to digital conversion, you have the signal that you want to sample and then you have some reference. And basically what you're doing is you're comparing the two. How does this compare to that? And if you play around with your UNOs, you'll see that the ADCs on them, you can use a five volt reference, you can use a 1.1 volt reference, or you can use an external reference that can be whatever you want it to be, as long as it's between 1.1 and five volts. So you can use a three and a half volt reference if you want it. And usually, Whatever uh, that's the right way to draw this. This is counts. So uh, an analog to 
digital, digital converter counts, basically. It gives you a number. We, we did this before when we played with the ADCs on here. Um, if I put, if my reference is five volts and I put five volts in and this is an 8-bit device, then I'm getting 255 and five volts, I'm going to get this. And if I put zero volts in, I'm going to get zero out. And what I see is a stair step that if I drew this line, ideally ran right through all the stairs like that. And so this number is 255, 254, Where did you get 255? 8 bits. Okay. 2 to the 8th power minus 1 is equal to 255. Okay. If I have a register that has 2, 4, 8 bits, if this is, it, it can range from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is 0, to all 1s, which is 255, because this follows similar to decimal. Uh, we never think about it this way, but this is what's going on. This is uh, uh, x to the first power, x to the second, x to the third, x to the fourth, and so on. Or is that the zeroth power? That's zeroth power. Zero, one, two, three, is that right? Yeah, so. Um, A one is, it, it's zero or one, so um, if this is a one, that's basically one, two, four, eight, is, is the way the representation works, and then you add. So eight plus four is 12, plus two is 14, plus one is 15. It's the same way digital works, we just have more than one and zero to work with, we have zero through nine to work with. Um, so what happens here is, when we talked about the world's not perfect, you know, we, we tell our lies and say, oh, I've got a five-volt reference on there, and everything's good. Well, I've got these, these lights are making noise, and, and so I get a little bit of noise on there, and so, so now my five jiggles a little bit. And now maybe today it's really, really hot, or maybe yesterday it's really, really cold, and that causes this to drift one way or the other, and, and, and all sorts of things start to go out of whack, and, and now maybe a five-volt signal uh, gives me a 253. Is that why their uh, state systems regarding uh, spin up, uh, what, radar and, and LIDAR, they need to be calibrated every so often? Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't know how they calibrate them, but it's a, it's a big thing. Um, when you're building, when, I build, when, when, when I'm designing stuff professionally, not just in my garage, um, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the contracts that we work have requirements that all of our test equipment be traceable, which means I have to go all the way back to a NIST laboratory at some point. And you know, the, the standard gets transferred and transferred and transferred, there's some loss, but I have to be able to know that when I'm measuring something, I'm measuring it within that tolerance. And, and this is what happens with these cheap things like this. It's going to get hot, it's going to get cold, it's going to be on a vibration table, there's going to be a, a car engine with spark plugs running right next to it, who knows what. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you know, the, the box that you're allowed to work in is, um, you know, 20 degrees to 70 degrees. And it's maybe, you know, uh, this much, vi no vibration to that much vibration, and and you know choose, and you know one doesn't have to go very far out. You're suddenly outside of the corner of the box, mm -hmm. and you really don't know how it's going to work, mm -hmm. especially after time and things internally have had a chance to drift. And, and you know you look at it with paint; your paint dulls over time. You didn't do anything to it, even if I keep it in a dark room, it's going to last longer, but it's still eventually going to fade, right? So time kills everything eventually. Um, except cockroaches and Tupperware, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and that lady's cancer cells. Henrietta Lacks. Yeah, Henrietta Lacks. Like, all the cancer research is done on the, on the cancer cells of this one lady who died 100 years ago? Um, yeah, about that. 
Her cells are still alive. Her there's, cancer is still living. There's an awesome book on that. The yeah, it's the immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks. Oh, wow, that's crazy. crazy. Yeah, that's what's her name? Henrietta Lacks, L A C K S. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I, I, I say all of cancer research. That's not true. I get it. Yeah, it's a large amount of cancer research. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially back you know 20 years ago when you couldn't take a sample and get it from point from New York to Boston. In, you know, it was hot, whatever, yeah. 20 years ago, 50 years ago, call it. So now we get into, well, here's the simple way of doing this. Okay. But if I want to get really accurate measurements, now I'm back to spending a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy and a lot of hardware doing things that will hold their calibration over large environmental span, environmental regimes, and time spans. And so now the thing is more expensive and more expensive and more expensive and more expensive. And thank God technology keeps moving right along. Because we talked about, and this, and this is perfectly applicable to the radar world too, for things where you work with a radar signal instead of a light signal, for whatever that reason might be. Because that's where your trade space says you ought to be. Um, we talked about it before. I can have a counter that has a clock that runs it, and it has an asynchronous reset right here. And then it has a, uh, I don't know, called another register right next to it that's a latch. So this is my latch signal. And Reset goes right through the both, and I say, ping, and the light goes out, it resets this register. This is, this is a no shit one gigahertz counter, and this thing's counting on rising edges and falling edges, and um, 30 milliseconds later, which is like counts in the millions, um, I get my light back or my radar beam back, and I latch that value, and I know exactly how far that was within the error of a half clock, and within the error of the stability of my clock. And now I can buy a atomic clock that's that big for $1,500. Microsemi sells them. And they are full mil spec compatible. So that means minus 30 to plus 120 degrees C, I think. Um, they're fully EMI compliant with 461G. They can take, you can put them in an airplane. They're freaking amazing. It's a wonder of. It's marvel. And, and they actually even tie into GPS and give you pulse per second. And, 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 and their stability is within <sighs> what was the math I did on that project? It was in twelve hours it would drift less than a nanosecond. What? That's incredible. I think the Rubidium. Uh, it, it, I mean, they've been out for a while, but uh, it was about three years ago, four years ago, Microsoft came out with this thing. And it's like, holy cow, that's a, that's a killer. How are they making with that? That's like insane. Like, I, it, it's, it's amazing. That is amazing. Um, and I've worked with, I've worked,
This is an MIT project. I worked with them for a little bit on a, uh, I was making the electronics on the back end. This laser ran. Uh, I ended up not making the electronics, but being the lead engineer for a short period of time that uh, was specifying how we work this, how we're, because the way these, these federally funded research centers work is they get a bunch of graduates to do stuff, and then they don't write down how they did it, and they'll swear that they're the only people in the world who can build these things. But the when you come and ask them, they say, well, yeah, well, we'll have to spend all this money to do it again. We already did it once. Why is it going to cost so much money? But you've got all the basic science done, and you've written papers. Yeah, but we didn't actually write down how we did it, so we're going to have to redesign it. And the guys who did it, they got their thesis and they're out the door getting paid a million bucks a year and we got to find a new set of grad students who really don't give a shit because they're not going to get a lot of this now because somebody else already regarded a lot. Not pessimism, realism, been there three times. <laughs> three different projects. Um, so this thing, is it saying on here? This airplane would fly over and it would, I think they had a, a mirror, that, a, a, a steering mirror, and it just looked straight down and it kind of did a swath thing. It's called a whisk broom. Whisk, 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 as it goes along. And um, I want to say that that thing had um, one or two centimeter resolution in height. They flew it over, and it's MIT, they, they flew it over beyond G3, of course. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling stuff. Flying over a building. Uh, they could get the full architectural back. You get these fun, these are called uh, vignetting or moire patterns, M-O-I-R-E. This is where you get certain it's like when you're driving down a highway and you look in the cornfield and you see this split. Yeah. That's because the rows are at, it's a range gate type thing. Um, They're at a spatial frequency that is a equivalent to your eye. So now your eyes start seeing this weird shit. It's, it's an optics issue. That's what these weird little that things are trying to pull. So I was fortunate, fortunate enough to work with these guys for a little bit. No, I didn't work for MIT. I'm not saying I worked there. I'm not saying that I worked on this instrument. I worked on, for a short time, on a derivative of this instrument. Okay. Um, it's the technology itself. It's just amazing. But the way this thing works is this. They've, they've got a laser that they shine at the ground, and they've got counters that count really fast. They, they, they did a, uh, I don't know what else here. They, I don't know what's proprietary, what they don't want getting out. Yeah. But it wasn't, they, they used a beam splitter to split the, split the laser into multiple beams, basically. And then it had multiple diodes on the back end and multiple counters, and they were all synced together and slaved and ran together. So that instead of having to go ping, 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 mm -hmm. ping, ping, they could go ping, 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 mm -hmm. and, and get multiple shots at once. Hmm. So, <coughs> that's pretty much all I was planning on going through tonight. Went two hours ago tonight. That's really cool. Um, <laughs> let's see if this thing's going to work for me. If this thing will work for me now, mm -hmm. I can show it off. It wasn't working earlier, but it's been sitting out in the car all afternoon. Is he on a... Oh, there it goes. So he's on a stepper? He is, but there's been some weirdness going on that he's not been... We'll watch and see if he's going here. Because so, a side question regarding that last frame you had up to get that kind of um, tolerance. Um, when did you run into, I mean, did they or, or would you run into issues using a laser in broad daylight? Wouldn't you have like a, a light frequency issue? Yeah, so what you need to do is you need to, you need to choose uh, your light color uh -huh. in a... Um, Work now, or they're going to do the same silly shit it was doing earlier. This is the same. Sorry, 
This is the this is the web page that I'm putting out on this thing. It's all um, CSS, HTML. And there's something uh, I, I kind of know what's going on here, but I don't know how to make it not happen. Somehow I'm getting all sorts of goofy requests. There it started back up, so now we need to work. And it's cleared out the request buffer. No, so uh, when you call for the plot, it stops. It does stop when I call for the plot because this Uno is doing everything it can, mm -hmm. uh, and it has to actually stop what it's doing to serve up the web page. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, so what this is supposed to do, what, what this was doing before, is um, I guess I could actually play a YouTube video of it actually working, but um, I wish I knew what was going on and suddenly and it's been working for three days just fine and it doesn't. Um, it has a 120 degree big field of view, so it'll run the, run the, the LADAR edge back and forth over 120 degrees. And so I've built a radar plot where, uh, a radar plot, where this is the center, that's plus 60, that's minus 60. The range rings are one meter increments, so one meter, two meter, three meter, four meter, out to eight meter. What it does is it gets a range, and it says I'm at this angle, and it does the computations to go from, that's a polar plot, so angle as in distance, to x and y coordinates, okay. and then writes it all files, and then it serves it up, it sucks it off, and I don't know why it's doing this now, I hate this. Um, so, since this is gonna call me a liar, if there's a, oh, the green stuff was, uh, it's one of the lenses, uh, I don't know if I'm there, no. up no, there. No, you see, it's now that I've told it to quit. Oh yeah, you did stop. Maybe it's a Chrome thing. Maybe it'll work in Firefox and it won't work in Chrome. Mm -hmm. Because I've never seen that before. <laughs> and now I just lost. Oh, because I actually shut down Chrome. <laughs> so Chromecast went away. God. I mean, if you really want to, I, I, I took a film of this working the other day. And, I could actually throw up the YouTube. It's the, the YouTube is linked to um, class already. So if you go to the class page, I've already put it up as. It looks like now the damn thing's over there, maybe. Yeah, whatever. So, um, is it still working? I don't know. It's gone awry. <laughs> Fine. It's been three. That's brutal. <laughs> Just annoying. Yeah, I imagine so. <laughs> I've got videos of it working. Uh, I've got, man. Well, if you've got videos, can you show then we can pull it up. Then we can try it. Oh, I'll get Chrome to freaking out. Scott, I mean, we say it, if it's not on video, it didn't happen. Yeah, I've heard that one before. <laughs> <sighs> okay, I want to cast. I don't want to cast a Chrome tab. Why couldn't you just pull up and you do the Chrome? Yeah, I guess I could. Yeah, okay. 
And actually, if you pull up the YouTube in Chrome, there'll be a Chromecast button on the YouTube video, so you can Chromecast YouTube direct. <laughs> one didn't work. Modern technology is amazing. So yeah, it comes down to um, it comes down to choosing your wavelength. So if you look at if you stay here on Earth, if you look at one 
two different graphs. Okay. The first one is solar output. Okay. Solar output looks kind of like this. You leave them, Glenn? Yeah, I gotta go. See you. Next round. Round. Nice meeting you. Yes, nice to meet you. This is uh, uh, 550 mm -hmm. nanometer light, I think, which is uh, yellow green ish. Okay. This is blue. This is ultraviolet. This okay. is mm -hmm. now you're getting up to cosmic ga gamma rays and stupid solar shit. Here you're at red. Here you're at near infrared. Here you're at short wave infrared, mid wave infrared, long wave infrared. Now you're going to radio signals. Gotcha. You're warm, you give off radio. Mm -hmm. That's how microwave sounders work. That's how a lot of the spacecraft are inside the uh, humidity in the air or whatever. Interesting. So the first thing you look at this and you say, well, mm -hmm. I certainly don't want to choose white. That's right there. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, yeah. that's where the sun's the brightest. And so, and you also don't want to choose light that's anywhere in here where we can see it. So I'm putting somebody's eyeballs out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I don't want to choose light that's even in here because that'll burn your eyeball out with an even lower power because you don't have a blink response to it. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize you're being blasted and then suddenly your, your retina is gone. Got it. Um, so over here it's okay because it's in the UV and it gets absorbed as long as, I mean, you can get sunburn on your eye. If you've ever seen an art building up close without having a mask on, and you go with your eyes itching for three days. And out here, it, it just goes right through and doesn't hurt anything. Um, so now the next thing you look at is, so you, so you know, okay, this is bad. I don't want to be true. I just figured this. I thought the sun was casting all of that. That's why I was So, well, it is where we can see. Right? I mean, that's why we can see there. That's where it's the brightest. Yeah. Um, I like that some people can see a little bit right there, but that, I think I'm full shit. Um, the next thing you want to look at is um, transmissivity of the atmosphere. The what? Transmissivity. Okay. How well does it let light pass through? Okay. Or how, how well does it let energy pass through? So. There's a couple of things to look at. The first off is, well, we'll talk about why is the sky blue. The sky is blue because of Rayleigh scattering as a wavelength of a signal. If I've got a wave that comes in here, it's only this big, it hits this, it kind of bounces off mm -hmm. at whatever incident angle it hit at. As the size of this thing that I'm hitting gets smaller and smaller and smaller, when it gets on the order of a wavelength or so, instead of doing a direct bounce, it causes me to bend. It causes me to maybe go that way, maybe go that way, maybe go this way. There's a million of these molecules all over the freaking place. Water, the reason water looks blue is it causes these shorter wavelengths to scatter all over the place. The reason the sky looks blue is because we can't see purple. We can't see violet. It's actually purple is like a trick. We can't actually see purple. <laughs> or pink. Maybe it's pink we can't see. One of those we can't actually see. It's a, they've done these really neat tricks where they do things up and then people say, yeah, that's that color. And then, then they do this other thing and it's like, no, that's that color. I've it's, seen that. Yeah, I've seen it a couple times. If we can't see it, then what are we seeing? It's your brain's see, interpretation, your brain's interpretation of those combinations of wavelengths. Yeah. They don't exist in nature. Yeah, it's pretty freaky. Yeah, it's pretty wild. You can look it up online. They'll have like a guy in a, in a certain tie, and you'll think it's like gold, or you'll think it's like one color or one two color combination, and you'll you'll show it to your friend, and he'll swear it's different. Or she, he'll she'll swear it's a different. Sort of like the golden blue dress thing. I was yeah, just gonna yeah, ask that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I watched a whole TED talk on this one time. I was like, well, it, 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 there, there are a couple colors that are not possible for us to see, per se. Pink doesn't exist. It's a mix of red and white, right, or whatever. It's our brain's way of interpreting this wavelength over here combined with that wavelength over there. Pink isn't a real color. Well, if you get to that point, isn't it like, you know, past the primary colors, a lot of colors don't exist? 
Because they're all combinations of others. Well, you, get, you do get a nice gradient across here. And we can see this entire gradient across here that goes from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to violet-ish, indigo, whatever we call it. We can see all of that. We perceive each one of those wavelengths separately. But when I say I've got a little bit of this one and a little bit of that one, then um, now my brain has to do something to make sense of that, to say, oh, I have these two signals coming in at once, and I have to somehow combine them in a way that in this sensory ability that I have, <clears throat> be able to make sense of it. And it's dead. Um, so weird games happen. And, and there's a, there's, it turns out there's a few colors that you will never, ever, ever see in nature. And it seems like pink, it was either pink or purple. Was one of these weird so colors. Odd. <laughs> it's just crazy to hear. So now the next thing, the next thing you got to look at is the transmissivity. So the so okay, clearly there's water in there, and and water is going to make stuff scatter. And and so when I send my laser beam out in the UV, especially, um, I've worked with UV sensors. Go out if you imagine a headlight on a foggy night. You see that beam coming off of it. But you see that glow all over around it. That's what UV looks like in the clearest of days, because it's scattering off the molecules in the air. Gotcha. So clearly, you don't want to use anything there. You're not going to be able to see crap. Mm -hmm. So now you're limited into this region, right? I don't want to burn somebody's eyeballs out. I don't want to be trying to compete with the sun or normal lights. Mm -hmm. I don't. I can't see anything over here. So now I'm in the infrared. Now. Well, I still would like to get away from the sun as much as I can. Ideally, I'd probably like to be right about there, right? I mean, that's where the solar thermal, uh, the least amount of thermal noise is, the least amount of everything else is. Ideally, I'd like to be there. Well, now you look at the transmissivity of the atmosphere. So, transmissivity says, uh, It says that if I, the unit is one, it's unity, it's 100%. If I put one unit of energy at this wavelength out, and I go some arbitrary distance, mm -hmm. what percent of that, I think it's like a point meter or something. Okay. How much of that is absorbed by the atmosphere? So okay. we talk about hydrogen lines, right? Or, or the, the way light is created is uh, energy comes in, causes an electron to pop out to a higher energy level. When it falls back out, it creates a specific color based on the energy level that it went from to. Wow. And, and it, so when that energy is given up, it's given off as a photon of light. Yeah. It could yeah. be RF, it could be whatever. Cool. But. So, Potassium, for instance, is an absorption band. Um, there is a hydrogen band. There's hydrogen. What you can do is go look up, uh, you can Google the solar absorption spectrum. Cool. And they got this really neat chart. It, it, it goes like over, you know, they've stretched red here and blue here over like 30 lines, and you can go through and you see these little black spots in there. The black spots are where that doesn't go through the atmosphere. That doesn't transfer. You can't see that color on the sun. When they're looking for certain chemicals on the sun, or some of those are proof that it's there because those are absorption bands, and so I know this chemical's there because that's absorbing the light. It, it likes to absorb this energy level. And it likes to give off this other energy level. So I look for a missing one and I look for an extra one. And now I can tell. That's how I can go out and look at these extra solar planets that are a gajillion miles away and say, there's one there. Because huh. it passes in front of its local star yeah. and I can see okay. absorption bands. Oh, the light changed like this. And then I realize that there's a lot of hydrogen there. It might have water. Oh, I see an oxygen line too. It probably does have water. <laughs> 
So, but what we see is we see something like this. And this is completely wrong. But our atmosphere itself, because of carbon dioxide, let's see, what is it? It's 73%, is that right? 70, 72% nitrogen, 25% oxygen, and everything else is a whole lot of other stuff. Yeah. And it doesn't take much of that other stuff to create an absorption line. There are certain frequency bands that I don't care how much power you put in them, they won't go that far through. I mean, they'll, they'll cause the air to evaporate and turn into a plasma before and, and make a vacuum and they'll travel through the vacuum. And it just won't go. Uh, there are others where it's perfectly clear and you can see forever. You know, you can see all the way around the Earth if the Earth is flat. But instead it's not, so you see sky and you see the ends of ships coming up over the edge. Not people falling off the edge. <laughs> I met a flat earther while I was on vacation. You what? I met a flat earther while I was on vacation. Pick my I ex. Pick my ex. I started to troll him that. and hope was like, shh. And then it just got too, I, I just couldn't do it. Did you tell him that flat Earth was silly, but you're uh, definitely a flat Mars person? <laughs> no, I started telling him I couldn't understand how people couldn't... Un I was like, I don't get how people can't understand that, that when you look at that picture, that even the best Hubble telescope pictures, they get all this pixelation, and that that's the big TV screens that, 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 that's keeping us from being able to, that everything's projected on. He's like, yeah, I know, right? I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've read this. There are people who believe this. Well, uh, they're idiots. <laughs> and I never thought I'd actually meet one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I started trolling, and I got that far. He's like, yeah, I know. And he went off on this other thing. And I was like, I, I can't even compete with myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I don't even know where to go from here. I've already shot my load. <laughs> I can't screw with the guy. But yeah, I, I, I was ready. You know, like, as soon as he walked out the door, I was like, oh, I know what I was going to tell him. You know, I used to work for people who worked on the moon, and they didn't even know they were out there. And you know, I used to swing a bucket of water like this, it stays on the string. They didn't know the rocket was on the string and going around like this. <laughs> oh, but anyway, so now you've got this absorption spectrum. So. No light, nothing, nothing here, right? That I'm going to get almost no signal back. Here I get a really strong signal back, but now I tie this and that, and now I say, oh, uh, I want to choose this spot here, or maybe that spot there, or maybe that spot there, and that's the line. We call it a line. It's like, you know, the frequency that we want to use. Hmm. But then you got to be able to generate it. you got to be able to see it. <laughs> so you need a detector, you need a source. Yeah, no, so, I mean, so detectors get more and more expensive as they go out that way. That's why I was hard, kind of hard figuring, to like, this has got to be expensive. It's too they, big. They, they, <laughs> they, they start getting harder and harder to use. Yeah. Um, this is in here in the invisible. This out here to here. Silicon. A lot of prior art there. <laughs> silicon. That's what all of our cameras are made out of. Just using silicon. Uh, you get out here and in the near infrared, you switch over from silicon <coughs> to indium, gallium, arsenide, and Silicon germanium, I think. I used to have this big chart and broke all these out. And, and it also told me what, what this band is really good for looking for. Hmm. You know, because there's some things you can, if you break this up into the right color bands and you fly over a field and look at it, you can tell which parts aren't getting water. You can tell that those are stressed because they've got bugs. You can tell that that's not getting enough nitrogen so it needs to put fertilizer on it in the right bands. Wow. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I just didn't realize we heard that. Yeah, and, and 
One of the things I worked on was a spacecraft that was supposed to go over and take all these pictures and do Landsat-like stuff, but also feed data to farmers. So, because, yeah. you know what, those big frickin', it turns out that those big frickin' tractors, to walk out there and turn it on, yeah. costs a thousand dollars. And we were trying to give them GPS-guided stuff. So, you know what, right now, if it, right then, this was, Two thousand two, two thousand three, somewhere in there, two thousand five, maybe. If guys want to go out and fire up his tractor, he may as well go ahead and and, and yeah, do the whole field because he doesn't yeah. know. Yeah. And we were trying to give, we were trying to tie GPS plus imagery in and say, look, you've spent a thousand dollars, only go fertilize that part of the field. Mm -hmm. A, it saves you money. Mm -hmm. A, it, B, it saves you time. C, it's great for the environment. Yeah. Um, that one thing. Oh man. The instruments the instrument to do one of these things was eighty million dollars. Holy sh Yeah. Yeah. And that was not a ripoff price. Holy I was God. one of the engineers who was trying to develop this instrument. Held the mirrors alone for this this thing, these telescopes, the mirrors alone were ten million dollars. Fifteen million dollars. So yeah, so you choose your lines. I choose a line here, right? If, I, if I'm right here or right here, I'm in this trough, maybe this one's a little better. Uh, and, and this is all off. But I think the truth is here where it's really the most is you get this big dip down, you can't see anything there anyway. Um, so the, you can look those kind of things up on tables. Okay. And you can I actually pull the data off the internet, yeah. put it, throw it into an Excel spreadsheet, and, and do whatever you want. But, Interesting. You choose you choose lines where it makes sense to use the lines. Absolutely. And then you build filters and whatever else. And it's, it's, a, it's a trade problem. It's I have a question on trade space for lidars. Um, I hear a lot of noise, or I read a lot of noise about um, lidar costs for this as they are applied to the self-driving vehicle domain. Yeah, um, that little gizmo was forty dollars or so. It operates at a hundred hertz. Um, I've got a, I've got a, doggone fancy car with one of the things. No like vacuum. Like a Roomba. A room. Well, it's a, it's it's a Neato, okay, and it actually maps out the room and does an orthogonal path within the room. It's not the a lot of them are just random walks. This one is, I map it out and I do, 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 oops, and it retains the map uh, from prior passes. So, so, so pretty much knows where it is. And, so it can cheat. And, and it has a little rotating gizmo on it that is a LiDAR of some nature. But I'm trying to. It's that only it works. <laughs> <laughs> but it goes fast. It, it does. It, so it does. And, and I'm sure that they don't have all the processing power in the world on this thing. They they no. probably you know if they've got more than a pick, <laughs> no, they, they might have. They, they might. They might. Um, but the bottom line is, huh, what changes are made to the technology, or what trade-offs are made in the technology? Uh, for a forty-dollar item or an integrated one that goes really quick with an, uh, a robot, because it, it's literally a spinning disc. The spinning disc is a laser, and the and the things in the cars, which are uh, ten thousand dollar range, and oh, there's this other guy who's going to make one that's a couple of hundred, and he's going to eat the whole planet. I've seen uh, it. If he, if he pulls it off, it'll work. He, and, and he's. I don't remember all the articles. He, he's gone back to some fundamental physics and and fundamental engineering and doing something a little different. Um, there's a couple different games to be played. Um, so first off, a little spinning. He's actually using a laser. And because he's using a laser and it's got a tight beam, um, he's getting around this guy who's got a wide dispersion and I lose energy fast. Mm -hmm. Plus he also gets tight, mm -hmm. uh, very narrow fields of view, so he gets very, very... And he really really only cares about one plane. Yeah. Right, and, and, and he only cares about this plane right here, so as that thing spins around, he gets... And 
he might actually be playing a game where he might only be running at 100 hertz and that thing's spinning at 10 hertz and he gets pow, 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 pow as he builds okay. them up. Uh, I understand. Yeah. And, and now as I start moving around, because I have the luxury of keeping that map, mm -hmm. you know, I'll come over here and I'll do things a little bit in the middle of the room and as I'm learning or, or, or I'll make a drive across the room. He literally but goes I'm straight. <laughs> Fine. I drive straight. I get a point here, a point here, a point here, and a point here, and some points here, 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 here. Some relatively simple algorithms. If I just connect the dots, dot, 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 dot. That's a wall. That's a wall. I'm driving a straight line. As I go along, I get another one that lands somewhere in between those two dots. Oh, I got one here. Oh, well, shit. Maybe I need to do that. Okay. You know, and I build my map as I go along. And, and it can be a very sparse map. Yeah, I, I think he, it, it runs into things still, um, but it uses... I mean, it's got it, bumpers, it, and you hit it, something, it, it's like, oh, shit, there's something right there. Seems, you know, I didn't see it. it seems to retain that information and navigates around whatever it ran to in the future. It, yeah. use, it seems to use the LiDAR system for to figure out where it is within the space that it has built. So now we're on the bottom end, the relative bottom end. And, and is that the PWM approach or is that the counter approach? The PWM approach. The, the counter approach is expensive. Okay. It's really expensive. Uh, and, and, and two centimeters where that a nanosecond was <laughs> complex. Yeah. That's, that's a fast, fast counter. That is a fast, fast counter. And the reason you use those is not for the normal things you do. Yeah. There's, um, the nice, the nice thing about those um, MIT and those same guys made something that's called the VCL vegetation canopy lidar, and it's nice because what what it, oh, what's it called auto dining? I don't remember what it's called. Um, I've got a tree, and I've got a tree. And then I've got a little tree, and a little tree in my forest, right? Mm -hmm. And I get multiple canopies in a forest. Mm -hmm. So these might be, I don't know, maple trees with big old leaves that can pick up a lot of light. These are oaks. They're tall, but they got little leaves and they let light through. And when I send a beam of light down, 90 some odd percent of it bounces right off that top layer of that, off that top canopy. But some small amount of it, clearly, otherwise you wouldn't be able to walk through the woods and be able to see, right? Some amount of it makes it down all the way to the ground. Mm -hmm. By the same token, some of it makes it all the way back out. Uh, there's a couple of spaceborne missions that are environmental, and there's a couple of airplanes that are doing the same kind of thing. They call it a VCL, I think, vegetation canopy lidar. They're using these high-speed timers because now they can discern a return from there, from a return from there, from a return from there. Sure. Sure. And now you take a million shots, and, and, and when you build up your picture, mostly what you get is this. Right, but you get a little bit of this and a sparse bit of that. Sure. And when you throw that into a 3D model, into a 3D point cloud, you can kind of rotate it around, and we have great I.O. filters. And they go, oh, my, look at that. that okay, the next, the next yeah. layer of the canopy is yeah. 10 oh, years down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got this kind of tree, we got that kind of tree, and oh, by the way, look, there's a road running right through the middle of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or a stream, or, or a dead fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So, you know, what are they doing on cars that make them so darn expensive? Now, you've got, now you've got fast. Yeah. Because now I'm moving 75 miles an hour. Actually, I'm moving 120 miles an hour down the road because I'm screwing off. Mm -hmm. And I need to be able to detect something so far out so that I can stop in that amount of time. So now I've got this range, mm -hmm. which equals power. I've got fast, which either equals multiple yeah. uh, transmitters slash receivers, or 
fast optics, <laughs> some fast optics, which is power, which is power. And then now I've got rugged. Yeah. Because not now, a real nice environment compared now, to my vacuum cleaner. Well, yeah. Now I'm driving down the road. And so now I'm driving down a dirt road. It's full of potholes. Yeah. And washboard at the stops. Environmental. Now it's now I'm in now I'm in Chimney, Alaska, and it's minus 35 C or F, whichever one's well out here. Minus 41 C slash F because that's the same temperature. Or I'm in. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, why not? Shitty. <laughs> or I'm in Phoenix in the summertime, and it's 116 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And uh, so now I have power to heat, power to cool. Because other things, otherwise things are going to go out of calibration. I've got all sorts of special stuff to, to keep it. And, and I really care that the damn thing is going to be accurate or all the rest of what I'm doing is for nothing. Accuracy. <laughs> Accuracy. And now, now, certification. Oh, God. Because okay. now you just said this thing is going to be in the line of human life. This is going to be the emergency brakes. This thing's going to drive around if it fucks up, somebody dies. And now it's a certification. So now you have a whole component. Now, <laughs> however, however much this costs, <laughs> now I need reliable parts. And now I have a test program that's at least that expensive. Yeah. With some subset of that test on every unit coming off the Yeah. Is the multiple um, said received, that's how, is that how it knows that something's moving? Because like, so, so my car, like it, it knows the difference between a car that's parked versus one that's going. It, it seems to be able to tell how fast the car had to be going to know whether or not the beep it made that I'm. They use radar for that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's all the radar. They just, they just use a regular. Uh, it's a millimeter wave radar when looking for Doppler. So if you're looking for the Doppler shift, which is easier to do, you can do it in optical, but it's actually right now easier to do most of the time in RF range because we've been doing it for years and we won't have opticals. You can, but there's games you got to play that make it more expensive. Um, and the Doppler shift is if I've got a source. Oh, this one didn't work earlier. Oh, if I've got a source here that's emitting this way, and I have an object here that's moving this way, and this bounces off of it, the frequency received is, I think it's frequency sent times 1 over V, basically 1 over V, uh, I think it was a V1 minus V2, because you, he, V1 minus V2, V1 plus V2, and he's assumed to be at zero. So if he's coming towards you or if he's moving away, you'll get the same Doppler shift um, because of the way frequency works. Um, that's not quite something like that. So, you know, it sounds, we can hear it. Whee! The train goes by, someone's on the horn. RF compresses the waves, whatever, because they're still moving the exact same speed. The speed of sound is 1,000 feet per second. If something's coming at me at 1,000 feet per second, the medium hasn't changed, what's moving hasn't changed, the only thing that can happen is the energy's changing. And the energy changes, it makes it higher frequency. Another way to look at it is, I'm going up, but I'm coming at you faster, and so it's getting to you faster. So that tells you the closing rates. Or separation rate. Or separation rate. Um, distance is just the time. time. In the PWM mechanisms here? Or? I mean, those little darn things, yeah, they're, they're down with little buttons that they yeah. put in the bumpers now. Yeah, well, you can get both. So, I mean, if I'm popping, I, I'm not going to do it with optical. Um, actually, some no. of those are sonic. Some of those are sonic. On That's what I call for the, the, for the parking stuff, yeah. I think, I even, think. I think even for um, some of the, uh, 
well, like, at least the near field stuff, to say when I'm driving down the highway and, and, and you know, that little light comes on in the yeah. mirrors and say there's somebody right there. Mm -hmm. And that might be Sonic. It's up in the ultras, so you can't hear it. Uh, dogs everywhere. Like, <laughs> what? That's not Sonic. Some of them might be. Oh, well, mine's definitely not because mine will yell at me if it's like snowing or there's something on the mirror for a minute. It'll, it'll, it'll yell at me. Sonic will do that. It's making weird things happen. So how come they don't all cross I'm in a traffic jam. Sometimes they don't. Well, number one, there's something. not enough of them there. But they're also all asynchronous and they're probably running trip codes. Okay. I don't know what trip code is, but I assume there's some pulse sequence encoding on the thing that you ship out and you look for when it comes back and if it ain't there, it ain't you. Yeah, there, there's, there's, there's two ways you can do that. You can do pulse code modulation, so you can say every unit that goes out has a serial number and it's permanently serialized and maybe it transmits its own serial number. Sure. And if it doesn't get its own serial number back, if it gets somebody else's, it just goes on the floor. The other thing you can do is you can sweep the frequency as you go. It's called an FM chirp. And mm -hmm. you, your frequency is whoop, 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 And you listen for that coming back. And because you're out of sync, you're not... Chances of two asynchronous systems being perfectly aligned is, is, is low. relatively low. Is the chirp codes how the key pops work with the cars? They use a rolling code. They're, uh, I don't know what keeps up with the cars. The key pops? You know, when you're clicking uh, this thing? Yeah. This thing isn't just one signal that says open or close. Oh, I know. Right. This is a rolling code. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's rolling. I didn't know it was rolling. My, my it's dead the expensive. Thing. We lose it. No, it, it's, it's uh, a rolling code is... Did we talk about linear feedback shift registers? Hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, we did. Maybe I missed that one. It's Wait. similar to an LFSR. It says, here's 8 bits, and I'm going to send you another 8 bits. And I'm going to send you another 8 bits. And on this end, this guy knows what the coding sequence is, and if you send me this 8 bits, and then that 8 bits, and then this 8 bits, I know what the next 8 bits should be. And if I miss, I go bang, 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 and I'm too far away and you don't get it, well, I'm going to send you the next 8 bits. On this end, I say, oh, you might have missed a few, bang, 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 bang. Oh, yeah. But if it should have happened before when I got there, you're not mine. And hmm. don't they have some... Weren't the criminals <coughs> advanced and they have some way that they do some mimicry or something? Yeah. I haven't heard about that, but I don't remember how they do it. Oh, there's people who are going out and locking people's doors all over the place now. I mean, once you know the code, once you know the code sequence, and it's the same for everybody. Oh. oh. Yeah, there's one, one half current. It's, yeah. Hmm. Well, put a, put a ring transfer.